revolutionary transformation of America was not achieved overnight. At the outset, none of us could foresee the end of the struggle. Few of us saw eye to eye on what was demanded of us as individuals and as a nation. But each began, step by step, to learn and to perform his allotted task. In those first anxious months after Pearl Harbor, the United States gradually adapted itself to the tremendous demands of a global war. In Washington, our immediate military capabilities and our potential strength as well were carefully weighed by the Commander-in-Chief, who took personal command and directed the part all Americans would play in the war effort. We know now that if we lose this war, it will be generations or even centuries before our conception of democracy can live again. And if we can lose this war, it will be only because we slow up our effort and waste our ammunition sniping at each other. Here are three high purposes for every American. First, we shall not stop work for a single day. If any dispute arises, we shall keep on working while the dispute is solved in the American way by mediation, conciliation, or arbitration until the war is won. Second, we shall not demand special gains or special privileges or advantages for any one group or occupation. Third, we shall give up conveniences and modify the routine of our lives if our country asks us to do so. We will do it cheerfully, remembering that the common enemy seeks to destroy every home and every freedom in every part of our land. As his principal advisor on the vital military planning of our conduct of the war against our enemies in Europe and Asia, the President, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, relied heavily on his Chief of Staff, General George Catlett Marshall. Marshall's rapid absorption of the fundamentals of a presentation, his decisiveness, and his utter refusal to entertain any thought of failure infused the whole War Department with energy and confidence. His ability to delegate authority not only expedited work, but impelled every subordinate to perform beyond his own suspected capacity. It would have been easy for General Marshall during 1940 and 41 to drift along with the current, to let things slide in anticipation of a normal end of a brilliant military career. Instead, he had for many months deliberately followed the hard way, determined that at whatever cost to himself or to anyone else, the Army should be decently prepared for the conflict. A little more than two months after Pearl Harbor, Brigadier General Eisenhower succeeded General Leonard Giraud as Assistant Chief of Staff in the War Plans Division. It was evident that somewhere on the War Department level, there would have to be an agency which could assemble and concentrate the sum total of strategic information for General Marshall's attention. In early March, General Eisenhower became the first chief of the newly created Operations Division. Principal concern of our top strategist in Washington was which of our imposing enemies to attack first. The situation in the Pacific, dominated by the Japanese, who had held the offensive since the blow at Pearl Harbor, was extremely critical. At the moment, there was no assurance that the Japanese would not quickly launch a major assault upon Hawaii, or possibly even upon the U.S. mainland. The Japanese conquest in the Western Pacific was almost as swift as Hitler's early successes in Europe. With a vital part of our Pacific fleet lying submerged or crippled at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese controlled the vast stretches of the Pacific, as far east as the Hawaiian Islands. The vulnerable American position in Hawaii was a major concern of our top commanders in Washington. The garrison in Hawaii was so weak that there was general agreement between the War and Navy Departments that its air and ground strength should be reinforced as rapidly as possible and should take priority over other efforts in the Pacific. The Navy Department had given General Marshall no estimate of the date when they expected the fleet to be sufficiently repaired and strengthened to take offensive action in the Pacific area. 
Our naval situation in the Western Pacific was at that moment completely depressing. The fleet could not attempt any aggressive action far from a secure base and dared not venture with surface vessels into Philippine waters. It was painfully clear that the Philippines could not at that time be reinforced directly by land and sea forces. But our military problem concerning our Asiatic enemy was not confined to the islands of the Pacific. On the western shore of the continental United States, the Japanese successes were regarded with mounting apprehension by Americans in the states west of the Rockies. Many feared that a Japanese invasion was imminent. The clamor of ground and air commanders on the west coast for defensive strength, clamors emphasized in hysterical terms by mayors, city councils, and congressmen, would, if answered, have absorbed more than all United States shipping, troops, and immediately available anti-aircraft force then in existence. The most pressing problem of the moment to the Army High Command in Washington was supplying and reinforcing Allied fighting forces in strategic positions all over the world. Australia was the base nearest to the Philippines that we could hope to establish and maintain. Reinforcement of this Australian base and the island stepping stones to it was a continuous process throughout the winter. Equally important was our air supply route via South America to Eastern Africa, a vital link with British forces based in Egypt and to the British Eighth Army, which was desperately fighting the Germans on the North African desert. Russia was accessible by way of the Middle East and our sea route to India was the vital line of supply for isolated China. Most heavily attacked of all our convoys were those on the runs to Great Britain and to northern Russia by way of the Arctic Ocean. Meanwhile, in Washington, the Operations Division worked around the clock, formulating the plans for the pattern of our future blows against the enemy. Through the 24 hours of each day, a steady stream of reports, requests for decisions, summaries of intelligence, poured into Operations Division from every continent and from the islands of the Pacific still held by us and our allies. Authority requested for 3,000 rifles for Coastal Command. Installation of Coastal Battery is recommended to reinforce the defense area. An activation of headquarters in this area be authorized to... ...and has found the defense measures in this area inadequate. Less than a month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, arrived in Washington to confer with President Roosevelt on the most effective methods of coordinating British and American war plans on both a military and a political level. This historic meeting was the first of many conferences of British and American leaders charged with mapping overall policy for allied military strategy throughout the war. Tide effectiveness in World War II established for all time the feasibility of developing and employing joint control machinery that can meet the sternest tests of war. The key to the matter is a readiness on highest levels to adjust all nationalistic differences that affect the strategic employment of combined resources. With these two things done, success rests in the vision, the leadership, the skill, and the judgment of the professionals making up command and staff groups. In World War II, America and Great Britain understood and applied these truths. In December 1941, the United States was faced with the problem of which way to turn. To the West, the nation which had attacked us a few weeks earlier must be stopped in the islands of the South Pacific. To the East lay the nation which hoped to conquer the world led by the little fear who planned to stifle freedom everywhere. Our enemies, widely separated strategically, were each in possession of a rich empire. The British and American staff saw no reason to change prior conclusions that the European enemy should be the first object of our attacks. Immediacy of movement was the keynote. We had to attack to win. It was a period of intense activity.
normal channels of administration were abandoned. The slow and methodical process of drawing up detailed movement orders was ignored. A single telephone call would start an infantry unit across the continent. Troops and equipment entrained with nothing in writing to show by what authority they moved. But the really tough job of transportation was getting American troops to England to train for the day when the Allies would be strong enough to attack the German army. In those first months after Pearl Harbor, thousands of American soldiers embarked at East Coast ports. Getting them safely to England depended on the cooperation of every American at home. For the slightest mention of the departure for overseas of a friend or relative, however innocently meant, might be intercepted by enemy agents and possibly cause the loss of many American lives. To combat such unguarded talk, the U.S. government launched an extensive drive to remind the unthinking citizen of the urgent necessity for him to obey security regulations at all times. The campaign was a great success. Most Americans quickly learned not to indulge in any speculation on troop movements, ship sailings, or possible locations of American camps overseas. The enemy was not standing idly by. While the United States slowly gathered its forces, the Axis High Command in Berlin plotted to thwart any offensive move we might make. The Nazis' major weapon against our transfer of troops to England was the submarine. Roaming the length and breadth of the Atlantic, the U-boats made the ocean crossing a risky operation for any Allied ship. Each trip between the U.S. and England was a dangerous mission for any type of a large ship. Every moment of the way, the crew stayed on the alert. For many of the passengers on board, this was their first experience at sea. But the novelty soon wore off, and the trip often grew monotonous. But not everyone on the Atlantic was asleep. Alle Mann unter Deck. Herr Stell! Fertig machen zum Tauchen. Fertig! Alles fertig. Achtung! Immer weiter! For the troops, life aboard a transport followed an unexciting routine. Most of the GIs, even those who had never seen an ocean liner before, looked forward to the day when they would put into an English port, and they could once again move about more freely on dry land. Until then, it was just a matter of continuing to exist. The most dangerous moments for those on shipboard were at dawn and at dusk. At these times, the crew was always doubly alert. Achtung! Steigen! Schnell! Erstes Torpedo fertig machen zum Schuss. Erste Torpedo fertig. Feuer! Ach, schon wieder einer. In the late winter of 1941-42, the U-boat campaign in the Atlantic was at almost the height of its effectiveness. 
we were monthly losing ships, including valuable tankers, by the score. A typical month was March 1942, when we lost in the Atlantic and Arctic areas 88 allied and neutral ships of 507,502 tonnage. During May 1942, when 120 allied and neutral vessels were sunk in the same waters, the United States sustained its highest loss of merchant shipping in any one month of the war, 40 vessels. For a time, even our vital sea lines to South America were in peril. Shipping was at a premium. Simultaneously, we needed every type of fighting vessel, cargo, and personnel ship. But in spite of these considerable losses, the United States was succeeding in landing thousands of American fighting men on English shores. In June 1942, General Eisenhower was placed in command of the European Theater of Operations, United States Army, and quickly assumed his post in London. The enormity of the job at hand made it imperative that he plunge into work at once. The United States Theater in Europe was established for the purpose of preparing the American part of the invasion of the continent, agreed upon between the British and American governments as the main strategical effort in defeating Germany. Across the English Channel, only 20 miles away, within sight of the British coast, the Germans were hard at work turning the coast of France into the outer wall of the new Nazi fortress of Europe, which they called Festung Europa. To storm that fortress, the invader would have to face the mightiest weapons the Nazis could bring to bear on the beaches. In June 1942, the possibility of Festung Europa being stormed successfully seemed remote indeed. My first job was to collect and organize a working team. To begin with, we brought over as the highest ground headquarters only the Second Corps. By building up from the bottom, we kept all our preparatory work concrete and specific and had time for careful selection of high commanders. is a syndicated feature of the American Broadcasting Company.